Welcome, ACPS families. Thank you for joining us. For in order to ensure all families are able to access this presentation in their preferred communication language, we are providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Amharic, and Arabic today. Please press the globe at the bottom of your computer screen and select your preferred language. If you are watching on a phone, press the three dots at the bottom right of your screen and then select your preferred language. Thank you. And now I'm going to, I'd like our interpreters to give their instructions, starting with Spanish and then Amharic and then Arabic. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a la presentación de esta noche. Para interpretación en español, por favor, oprima en la parte inferior el globo o el icono del, del mundo y seleccione español para escuchar mis palabras en español. Muchas gracias. En vez de amistachu, en cuanto a amistachu, zare la mena del gau la mesa af nebab. Con cuanto a mitfalu bukohone la amarinya la metekab, ya la meliketi ya la betintena kuna zahedachu. Japan, Japanese ya milon ba mitna kusat amarinya madam shlalachu. مساء الخير اهالي مدارس مدينه الكسندريا احنا بنرحب فيكم بهذه الامسيه اليوم ومن من حاب نعلمكم بانه هذه الجلسه مترجمه باللغه العربيه وفيكم الاستماع لهذه الترجمه باللغه العربيه مباشره اذا اخترتوا القناه طبعا هي مكتوب شانيز ولكن هي العربيه القناه الشانيز هي اللغه العربيه شكرا And now, let's welcome School Board Vice Chair Veronica Nolan to introduce our co-hosts. Thank you so much. I could not be more honored and excited to be at Alexandria City Schools' second community read-in. Today, the focus is Alexandria's role in massive resistance and school segregation. And I could not be more honored to introduce our illustrious panel. We have Dr. Douglas Reed, who is the Professor of Government and Director of the MA Program in Educational Transformation at Georgetown University. He wrote this incredible book, which I actually have um, a, a copy of that I'm very proud to say, Building the Federal Schoolhouse, which will be the basis of today's conversation. And then we are incredibly fortunate to have our very own, the incredibly talented Kenitra Wood, who is our ACPS Executive Director of Equity and Alternative Programs. We are also honored to be joined by Dr. Hutchings, who will close out this, um, close out this uh, incredible forum this evening. So we're honored and thankful to his leadership that allowed such a conversation to take place. So without further ado, let me just give you a quick overview of what you can expect for today. We have a presentation from our two panelists, Dr. Reed and Ms. Wood, that will last approximately 30 minutes. This is on Facebook, and it's on Facebook that we will be accepting questions. The remaining 20 minutes of our presentation will be receiving questions from Facebook and allowing our panelists, again, Dr. Reed and Ms. Wood, to respond to those questions. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our panelists. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Nolan, for a lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for making the time uh, on, a, on a Thursday evening to uh, um, learn about Alexandria and, and some, some history. And also, we're going to try and connect it to uh, uh, present day events. So what we're going to do today is we're going to try to understand uh, Alexandria's role in the, in the broader picture of Virginia's segregation, starting with massive resistance, and carrying it forward uh, uh, to today. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit about uh, uh, the Bird Organization, which was the primary kind of uh, machine that governed Virginia in the 1950s, 60s uh, time period uh, and its relationship to the Democratic Party in Virginia. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the Bird's Organization within, within Alexandria in particular uh, and, and the presence of, of racial moderates in Alexandria and their, their changing commitments to incremental desegregation um, in, within the massive resistance period. Uh, we'll also, Ms. Wood is then going to connect massive resistance and some of those commitments to contemporary resistance and indifference about questions of, of segregation uh, and equity in schools. Uh, I'm going to then come back and we'll talk a little more about um, uh, Superintendent John Albaum, who came in in 1963, and his uh, acceptance of neighborhood segregation uh, within the late 60s and early 70s. 
Uh, and then we're going to really focus on one meeting in particular. Uh, there was a meeting between federal bureaucrats and, and Superintendent John Albaum that really kind of showed the political pressure that he was under and, and how that was exerted. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about white flight uh, and parental influence and, and the creation of a track system within Alexandria. And Ms. Wood will then tie that back together with uh, trying, to, trying to figure out the ways that ACPS can move beyond uh, resistance and, and, and indifference about race and, and racial equity. So let's start with the Democratic Party uh, and the Byrd organization. So in the center of this picture, you'll see then uh, State Attorney General uh, J. Lindsay Almond. Uh, and on, on the left-hand side of the picture is his wife, uh, Josephine, and then Harry Truman, uh, who is then President of the United States. Um, Harry Truman had just introduced uh, a package of, of civil rights, or was about to introduce a package of civil rights le legislation that was going to really, really make life difficult for the Byrd regime in, in uh, uh, Virginia. Uh, but nonetheless, the Democratic Party and the Byrd regime were really kind of joined at the hip, uh, uh, both nationally and uh, locally. So the Byrd regime, I need to explain a little bit what that was, uh, because it, it really is, is, it's hard to overstate the power of, of, of Senator Harry Byrd and his followers throughout the state of Virginia in the 1950s uh, going back to the 40s and into the 1950s and early 60s. Um, Harry Byrd uh, was uh, from basically near Winchester. His family uh, ran an apple orchard. Uh, uh, and he pulled together a collection of followers who were a loose, loosely affiliated but really tight um, tightly disciplined group of, of political officials. Uh, and as J. Al Lindsay Almond explained to a Time a magazine reporter in 1958, it's like a club, except that it has no bylaws, constitution, or dues. It's a loose, loosely knit organization, you might say, between men who share the philosophy of Senator Byrd. Senator Byrd demanded fierce loyalty and tolerated very little dissent. Um, and it was highly organized at the local level, down through the, the, the county judges and, the, and, and, and city council members. There was a political base in Southside, uh, but it, it was woven throughout, throughout the state of Virginia. So what did, what did the Byrd regime stand for? Um, we talked last time in this community reading about the frugality of T.C. Williams, and that really was the, the flavor of the Byrd regime. They wanted very low taxes, uh, and they had this sort of pay-as-you-go kind of commitment to fiscal conservatism. Uh, they also, because they didn't want to pay very much money, um, they had commitments to low levels on education, health, health care, and highways. Virginia did very little in terms of public services in the, in the 1940s and 50s. They also were premised on systematically disenfranchising not only African Americans, but whites in Virginia as well. Um, and they systematically deprived individuals of voting rights. And that was primarily done through, through the poll tax. Uh, in order to vote in Virginia at this time, you had to pay a poll tax consecutively for three years and six months in advance of an election in order to vote. If you fell behind on that poll tax, you would virtually never be able to uh, pay it off. Um, so what that meant was there was very low turnout in Virginia elections. Uh, between 1925 and 1945, the average turnout in a Democratic primary, and this was a single party state, the average turnout was 11.5%. So not even, roughly, not nearly 90% of the electorate didn't vote in Virginia elections in the 1930s and 40s. Okay, they were also really fundamentally committed to maintenance of segregation. Okay, Part of why they needed to suppress the vote was because um, in Southside, where their primary base was, they were going to be outnumbered by uh, uh, African Americans. So uh, suppressing the vote was the only way that they could stay in power. I want to quickly talk about the timeline of desegregation in Alexandria because this timing is important for understanding when people sort of change their minds. Just pretty quickly here. Um, we all know 1954 was the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. 
1956 saw the rise of, of massive resistance. And we're going to talk a little bit about what, what the components of massive resistance were. Uh, it started in February of, of 1956. By the time we get to August of 1958, there were 14 uh, black students in Alexandria who petitioned to be enrolled in the all-white schools. We talked about their um, treatment last time and the denial of those petitions. Uh, because they were denied in August, they filed the lawsuit in September of 58. In January 19th, 1959, uh, there was both a step federal court decision and a state court decision that struck down all of these laws that comprised massive resistance. Interestingly, that was uh, Robert E. Lee's birthday, January 19th. Um, January 22nd, the school board then uses what it termed non-racial criteria to again deny the petitions of all the 14 plaintiffs three days after the, the, the striking down of massive resistance. Judge Albert Bryan in Alexandria requires uh, nine of these students to be admitted uh, on February 4th and on February 10th those nine students enroll uh, in uh, three white Al Alexandria schools. So that's just sort of the quick timeline. The, the, the things moved pretty quickly by the time we get to uh, August of 1958. Okay, what was massive resistance? What are the components of it? So Senator Byrd, uh, who was an ardent segregationist, uh, basically posited to, in, in February of 1956, he said, if we can organize the Southern states for massive resistance to this court order, the Brown decision, I think that in time, the rest of the country will realize that racial integration is not going to be accepted in the South. So massive resistance was an effort by the governments, uh, starting in Virginia, Virginia originated massive resistance, to block implementation of Brown versus Board of Education. And they did it because they needed to preserve segregation because that's where their power base lay. Um, they also did it because they were individually, individually racist. Um, so their efforts to block Supreme Court decisions were centered around a number of pieces of legislation. Um, one of their commitments was they wanted to end compulsory schooling and education. So students, uh, uh, so the governments could close schools and there wouldn't have to be uh, an ability to require students to go to school anymore. Uh, they enacted school vouchers and we'll see in a minute how that played out in Alexandria. What those school vouchers did was enable individuals whose schools were being desegregated, white individuals, to use public funds to pay for private schools that, seg uh, that were segregated, that discriminated against African Americans. Uh, the pieces of legislation also slashed state funds to any school uh, that voluntarily desegregated. There was talk up in Arlington that they were going to go ahead and comply with Brown versus Board of Education, um, and the state was going to take away their money if they voluntarily complied. The, they also passed laws that said the state would take away state funds for any school that complied with a court order to uh, uh, desegregate schools. Um, finally, if all of those failed, then this governor would be authorized to close any school that underwent uh, uh, desegregation. So these were really uh, a series of kind of nested pieces of legislation that acted as a legal bulwark against Brown versus Board of Education. And they were effective in stalling uh, uh, desegregation for, for quite a few years. In Alexandria, I just want to talk briefly about how this affected private schooling in Alexandria. So these vouchers were available um, starting in, uh, uh, well, in Alexandria, they were available starting in 1959 because uh, the school was undergoing desegregation. You couldn't get the voucher if the school was not going through desegregation. Uh, and Alexandria stopped giving them out in the fall of 1964, um, shortly after uh, John Albaum arrived. Uh, statewide, they continued to be distributed until uh, 1969. But we see from this chart that uh, Congressional School uh, had over 100 students that uh, accepted the voucher. The voucher was $250 for high school um, per semester. Uh, it amounted to roughly about one-third of the private school tuition. A, a lot of families also sent their children to elite boarding schools up in the Northeast, um, uh, Exeter and, and, and Phillips Academy. Um, 
Interestingly, uh, there were some families that used the, the, the segregationist voucher to send their child to a desegregated private school. So 40 students uh, attended Burgundy Farm with the assistance of a, uh, a, a state-funded voucher, but Burgundy Farm was, was desegregated. There was nothing in the law that said you had to go to a, a, a segregated school. Uh, the state just simply assumed that anyone who took the voucher would go to a segregated school. Also, interestingly, uh, a number of folks used these to go to public schools, particularly in the District of Columbia. Okay, so who are the moderates in this story, right? Um, Armistead Booth was the state senator, a state senator from Alexandria, uh, and he had um, a, uh, a long-standing reputation uh, within Virginia politics. Um, he was the son of Gardner Booth, uh, who was the main, quote, uh, according to one uh, historian, the main pillar of the Byrd organization in Northern Virginia. So he was closely tied uh, in, in terms of relationships to the Byrd organization. He was a World War II veteran, however, uh, and he was a lawyer. Uh, and he really sort of saw segregation as being counterproductive. Um, although his great, great uncle, uh, General Lewis Addiston Armstead, led Pickett's charge uh, in, in Gettysburg, um, he nonetheless felt that uh, segregation was irrational, uh, especially in transportation. Uh, and so he proposed in 1950 banning segregated trains in Virginia, for example. Uh, and when Brown versus Board of Education came down initially, he wanted local schools to have the autonomy to decide what to do. We'll see how his, his position changes over time. He was sort of the most accommodationist of Brown within Northern Virginia, uh, and we'll see how his views changed over time. So what would a change have meant to the Byrd regime? Um, this is, is Governor Almond. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in a cover of um, uh, Time magazine in 1958. Uh, this quote I'm going to give you is actually not from this time period, but when he was a, a, an attorney general. And it shows how committed they were to the Byrd regime, even though they recognized its flaws. So he says, the only sane and constructive course to follow is to remain in the house of our fathers, even though the roof leaks and there may be bats in the belfry, rats in the pantry, a cockroach waltz in the kitchen, and skunks in the parlor. So they were keenly aware that this was an unworkable kind of thing, but they were wedded to it because their power came from that position. Uh, and so in order, if, in order to hold on to power, they had to hold on to segregation. So the period of massive resistance winds up hardening views of Alexandrians. Uh, this picture is of James M. Thompson, uh, who has also uh, represented Alexandria in the state Senate uh, alongside uh, Ar Armistead Booth. Uh, and he was characterized as the leader of the most fanatic segregationists throughout the, the, the massive resistance era. Uh, between 1955 and 1957, um, his vote tally increased by a thousand votes out of fifteen uh, out of fifty three hundred casts. So, the experience of massive resistance and his hardline stance yielded uh, uh, greater support for him. And Booth was actually quite alarmed by that by that increase uh, for his own reelection chances in nineteen fifty nine. Moreover, um, the 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 city council was committed to segregation and in fact went out of their way to remove the only school board member who had voted uh, for desegregation after the school district lost its legal case. So the city council removed Herman um, Mueller from, from the school board, um, led by former mayor Marshall Beverly, who was a cousin of Harry Byrd and Booth's opponent in the 1959 state, state Senate primary. So in that primary, uh, we see some important things um, emerge. Um, massive resistors really wanted to um, recapture uh, the, the momentum. Uh, the court decisions had sort of taken the wind out of their sails and, and 
Uh, Governor Allman's capitulation in the face of that incensed a lot of, of massive resistors. Um, and so they really actively mobilized. Um, and Marshall, uh, Marshall Beverly was running a, a very nasty campaign against Booth. Uh, and that campaign was led by uh, uh, Booth's neighbor, uh, James Thompson, uh, who was uh, Harry Byrd Jr.'s brother-in-law. So there's a lot of family relations and it's a very personal kind of fight. Uh, and this is a, a, a very snarling, bitterly contested election. And Booth actually moves into the direction of the massive resistors and moderates his, his or hardens his earlier moderate view. So his 1959 campaign platform was public schools segregated to the limit allowed by law. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things in all this is this is the moderate position within Alexandria at the time, okay? And in an earlier uh, letter that he wrote, um, and this letter is, has some pretty um, difficult language. Uh, in 1957, he wrote a letter to a former friend from college, and he sort of said that there are gonna be four elements that needed to be addressed in race relations in the South. Uh, and the first, and this is a full quote in, from the letter, uh, is to acknowledge, even if regretfully, that the Supreme Court decision is the law of the land. Uh, second, to recognize the traditions and customs under which we have lived for 350 years. Uh, three, to recognize the Negro race as a race is very inferior to the white race. Uh, and four, to recognize that there are individual Negroes who have the character, intelligence, and other requisites entitling them to full first-class American citizenship. To my mind, this is key to the situation. So his position becomes very different from his earlier one. Um, he stresses that there are a few individually exceptional uh, African Americans who may be entitled to full citizenship, um, but as as a as a as, as a group, um, African Americans uh, could not um, be um, granted that full citizenship. So it's a very hurtful and and biased position, uh, but it it led to him winning in a landslide against Beverly. What's interesting is that Booth's position winds up mirroring, mirroring T.C. Williams' views. We talked last time about T.C. Williams and his efforts to prevent uh, individuals from, from desegregating schools, and Booth winds up moving toward that position. Okay, I think we're going to turn it over to Ms. Wood to handle, uh, well, let me, before we do that, by the time we get to the uh, February uh, 10th of, of 1959, uh, desegregation happens in Alexandria, mostly peacefully. There were some protests, um, but it was exceedingly foot-draggingly, painfully slow. Um, this is Catherine Turner getting into uh, uh, her family's car uh, after going to school on the first day of, of desegregated education in Alexandria. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ms. Wood to talk through the next part. Thank you so much, to, um, Dr. Reed. Um, when we talk about from massive resistance, like Dr. Reed just mentioned, to resistance and indifference in Alexandria, first want to um, just reiterate some of the things that Dr. Reed said and, and to just say that massive resistance was a product of calculated campaign by Virginia's political machine called the organization. And it was to maintain white supremacy at all costs and to deny African Americans full participation in political, social, and economic life. There were deep ties to the maintenance of the caste based ideology of white supremacy that we have to pay attention to as we look at where we are right now and how some of those things have flowed through the years. The beliefs that were embodied back then, that separate facilities and schools were best for both races. But we know that those separate schools were not equal, let alone equitable, as we achieve for those things to be happening today. The criteria and assumption about students' learning capacity and potential um, was just at a level of um, complete and utter um, disrespect and human decency. When you talk about where students were coming from, 
sufficient space in schools was a reason. Academic performance and scholarly potential was um, put on display and noted whether students could or could not attend an all white school. And the effects, the belief that the effects of mixing slow African American learners with advanced white students, as if there were not students who are white that might have been a little slower academically, or students who are of African American descent that were advanced. Um, that juxtaposition of those two concepts was a part of that belief system. And so when we think about where we are with the resistance and indifference today, some of the same tactics that Dr. Reed just mentioned came into play, but it morphs into different ways that it shows up today. When you look at the resistance, we have what we call power, time, and potentially resource hoarding of specific programs or schools or where we live. We talked about in the last meeting where um, we know that we still divide our school system and what schools um, students go to based on neighborhoods. And some of those neighborhoods may be dependent on like races and so on and so forth. And so we may see, especially at our elementary level, um, demographic differences and levels of um, inequality in where students are attending school and who they're attending school with. A comfort level in talking about you know, our past and where we were as um, a race in history is something that we have to pay attention to and that we do pay attention to. But it is something that uh, a lot of our white families don't necessarily want to talk about. And, it, and when things become uncomfortable, then we tend to shut it down. And all of that maintains systems of advantage within our system and within our society as a whole. It's not just unique to Alexandria, but we have to recognize where we are and where we stand in all of that. And we think about our one high school, even though it is physically integrated, if you walk through our hallways and you look into our classrooms, especially at the secondary level, then you can tell the segregation that is happening and that is real within our schools, even though we are as diverse as we are as a school and a school division. Classes like our honors, AP, DE, STEM, Governor's Health and Sciences Academy, are things that I mentioned last time, but we see those inequities happening. We see the demographic differences within those classrooms, even today. And I wanna just take a minute. Um, Dr. Reed talked about the white flight and how the voucher system happened in the past and um, families were moving their students into private schools and why they were doing that because they did not wanna be a part of integrated schools. And so when we think about that, we have one program in particular that I am most familiar with, and that's the STEM Academy at the Minnie Howard campus. And I just recall um, the first year of the STEM Academy, and we were having a conversation with colleagues a couple of um, days ago, and someone mentioned that the Academy um, was all white, and it's on the second floor, and it's separate, and it's an elite Academy, and that's the perception. But what people don't realize is that that Academy was not originally all white, and that when it was placed on the second floor of the building, it was an academy that was very diverse from students from all across our demographics. And very little white students were in there that first year. And so when the notice of how the perception of what that academy brought to the table, all honors classes, they were on the second floor, they had all the same teachers, this perception of a private school within the public school started to emerge. And it emerged in our community, it emerged within our schools. Um, and that concept still is kind of spoken about today. But when that was noticed, when we talk about being e equitable and we talk about what it takes to ensure equity, given that situation and given the socioeconomic status and demographics of our two middle schools, the team at that school decided that they had to approach that recruitment a little differently and through an equity lens. And so no longer could they rely on the equal access and giving everybody the same thing and doing the same thing with everybody, but had to look at it from a standpoint of equity and removing some of those barriers that brought about that perception. And so we also wanna think about the fear of having open and honest dialogue about race 
and our history. And this presentation and these set of reading opportunities gives us the opportunity to have that conversation within our community um, and to do that in a public forum and not hide behind things like social media or media as a whole to be able to have those conversations. We wanna have them open and honest dialogue about where we are and who we are as a system. We have to think about that. We have to think about the sense of entitlement that comes with some of our community members and how that sense of entitlement from the past and has bled into the future, and excuse me, our, our current and, and into our future of what that entitlement looks like and how that affects our decision-making moving forward. And so when you hear things like, you work for us as a school system. We do. We work for our students. We work for our community. We work for the greater good. But when that statement is being made, the question I always ask is who does us include and who does us not include? And we have to think about those things every time we are having conversations with our community members and there's pushback around being a division that has racial equity at the heart of everything we do. So we are here for all of us. We do work for all of us, all of our students and our community, but not just one group or another, everyone. Dr. Reed. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Wood. Um, I wanna continue the, this kind of narrative, the historical narrative um, and picking it up roughly in the, in the, in the mid 1960s. Uh, Superintendent John Albaum arrived in uh, 1963. Uh, and at that time, any black student that wanted to attend uh, formerly all white school had to petition the school board individually um, in order to move out of uh, the, the two uh, Jim Crow schools that had been created. Um, Albaum got rid of that, uh, that system when he arrived in 1963 uh, and he dropped the petition requirement. And he went to a system of, of neighborhood schools um, that had uh, both boundaries that were drawn for, uh, on, you know, that were uh, clustered around uh, the, the features of particular neighborhoods. Um, Residential segregation existed and still exists um, within Alexandria. Um, and, and that residential segregation, however, meant that there were a lot of elementary schools um, that, that remained all white. So even once they dropped the, the requirement of petition uh, and moved to neighborhood-based uh, zoning uh, within, within Alexandria, um, the racial imbalances within, within neighborhoods pretty, pretty quickly became apparent. Um, moreover, there became uh, a dynamic uh, within the school system of being concerned about sort of contagion is the term that wound up getting used when, when schools became too heavily African-American. Um, so we're gonna look at some numbers about uh, the level of segregation within uh, um, uh, Alexandria's schools. Um, I had to break this chart in half to fit it on the screen, and I apologize for the small type, but um, on the east side, uh, the two schools that were um, the, the required uh, all black schools, Jefferson Houston and Lyles Crouch, in 1966 were still all, all black. Uh, no, no white students had, had uh, attended those schools. Um, Theodore Ficklin and Cora Kelly uh, were schools that were seeing increasing numbers of, of uh, black students. Um, and that was leading to a, a dynamic of white exodus from those, uh, uh, from those schools because of ongoing continuing concerns about uh, desegregation. Uh, on the southern end of the city, Robert E. Lee was also in increasingly, um, uh, had see, seeing higher percentages of, of black students. But in the central part of the city, we see a very different dynamic, very low levels of one to 2%, up to 3% at George Mason uh, of, of um, uh, black students within the elementary system. Um, and then when we get over to the west side, it's completely different. Um, so only William Ramsey had a very small 1.1% uh, enroll, black enrollment in 1966. Uh, again, this is 12 years after Brown versus Board of Education and the other three schools uh, had, had no um, black students at all. Um, I also want to show that um, 
at this time, many of the students with disabilities attended um, dedicated facilities that were uh, separate from, from neighborhood schools. Um, uh, they are referred to as the trainable center for um, uh, students with uh, profound cognitive disabilities. And then the Prince Street facility was one that was used for uh, uh, more behavioral um, uh, issues. Um, those two um, uh, schools saw, uh, saw very high percentages, well, um, higher than, than, than normal percentages for uh, African-American students. So they were seen as sort of containment zones uh, uh, to uh, keep black students uh, away from the other white elementary schools. So the federal government began noticing this, right? Uh, they were paying close attention to the imbalance within these neighborhood schools. Um, and they were starting to demand that, that school districts throughout the South do more, beginning roughly in 1966. Um, the Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, um, uh, uh, Office of Health, Education, and Welfare was responsible for implementing uh, the newly enacted uh, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was giving more money to Southern schools, but it had to condition that money on the fact that these Southern schools were actually actively desegregating. Um, so in 1971, um, Albom was responding to uh, a growing political uh, ferment within, within the city. Um, and there was a lot of problem, there were a lot of problems that were happening within the high schools. Uh, there was racial conflict, uh, there were um, a, a lot of incidents that were leading to um, increasing frustration with the, within the black community. Um, and these range from within school issues to out of school issues. And we'll talk about those next time when we talk about um, the backstory to uh, the Remember the Titans um, uh, film. Um, but what he wound up doing because of that was responding to political pressure on the high school front. And so he proposes uh, what was referred to as the 6222 plan. So uh, six grades, elementary, um, two grades for middle, for middle school, and then two high school, uh, a high school that encompassed ninth grade and 10th grade, and then one single high school that encompassed uh, uh, 11th and 12th, and that was T.C. Williams. So that plan became the organizational uh, plan for uh, that was featured in uh, Remember the Titans. Okay. T.C. Williams becomes the one single high school. At that time, it was only juniors and seniors. But his response to uh, the political uh, turmoil of the time was not what the federal government was really concerned about. The federal government was really focused on the elementary level. So in terms of where legal jeopardy lay, uh, it really lay with the, their inability to address the ongoing elementary um, segregation. So there came a meeting in July 20th of 1971. I'm gonna, I, it's a remarkable document I found in the files where uh, someone had uh, taken very detailed notes and then transcribed the meetings of that notes, uh, uh, transcribed the, the notes from that meeting. And so I almost have a verbatim account of what happened uh, in, in this meeting. There are two um, uh, officials from HEW, Ernest King and James Wego, um, and Albaum is joined by his deputy superintendent, Raymond Sanger. Um, and the issue is what, what's going to happen in the elementary schools because they're not meeting federal requirements. So HEW officials are, are, are knocking on the door saying, what are you going to do? Um, Albaum is is giving them the story that they have spent the political capital on the 6222 plan um, and that there's not much wiggle room within the community um, and they're looking to buy some time on the elementary school front. So I, I want to go through the, the, the account of this because the language that they use is actually quite telling. So Raymond Sanger starts off the meeting and he wants he wants a delay from from the ETW officials uh, and he says uh, and again, this, this, this is a remarkable document that uh, um, uh, is, preserves almost verbatim what, what was said. Uh, he says, I feel that the 6222 plan is going to save a section of the city around George Washington High School because we had a major move out of solid citizens. We are hoping this will arrest the situation and stabilize the community. 
If we were to integrate more our predominantly Negro elementary schools, it would confuse the issue. I would like to delay the elementary problem for a while. For his part, Albaum um, is starting to show some of the stress uh, that, that uh, uh, the federal government is, is putting him under. Um, and he, he's saying, look, we do not indicate unwillingness to cooperate with you. We are getting phone calls from very prominent people in Alexandria who do not have any children in school, who are officials in the federal government, and who are nationally known. All, I'm, all I am getting from outsiders, from the school board, city council members, prominent people, is caution. You have to remember that Alexandria um, was home to Gerald Ford, who was a member of Congress and then within a few short years would be uh, vice president and then president of the United States. His kids went to uh, Alexandria City Public Schools. Um, there were Supreme Court justices. Hugo Black lived in Alexandria. Um, there was a very prominent set of political actors who lived in Alexandria. And Albaum, Albaum is hearing from them um, um, because the political arrangements are getting uh, untenable for him. And it, they, these folks are making it clear that the regime doesn't want elementary integration. And Albaum continues along this vein. He says, we have lost white support. We have lost black support. Parents think we have not kept, comp uh, kept promises. I am trying to indicate the box we are in. There is a caution on our, part, on our part, and maybe a caution on the part of the school board and the community because of the existing power structure. So Albaum is feeling the power structure. He's a superintendent. He arguably could do whatever he wants, unless he wants to get fired by the board. But um, he's feeling the pressure from the power structure. And this is the, the, the community, the regime that is supporting uh, uh, the ongoing segregation within, uh, within Alexandria. Um, and he's really um, sort of put in a, in a, between a rock and a hard place uh, between the federal government and, and local, local officials. HEW's response, uh, it was basically tough luck. Um, the, the, the verbatim, this is the end of the minutes, uh, I'll read them verbatim. So Mr. King says, Whatever you decide to do, you need to decide between now and the 1st of September. This is late July, okay? Mr. Wego says, we actually, we have to have an answer by the last of July about whether they're gonna move forward or not. So within, within 10 days, they need to know what's gonna happen in the elementary school. Albaum winds up sort of asking them, but more himself, what alternatives do we have? Do we describe any plans that the school board would have? Um, the, the, the notes uh, conclude with the meeting adjourned at 4, 4 p.m. It was entirely cordial. So there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure that's being exerted. Um, but, but these four gentlemen apparently uh, um, uh, were able to converse in, in a cordial manner about this. But I want to talk a little bit about what Albaum was afraid of and, and where this, this is all going, right? So one of the things that's important to realize is that as that elementary uh, integration occurs, there's increasing white flight, okay? So what we see here in this graph is the change in the percentage of uh, uh, enrollment, or the, percent, the, the change in student enrollment as a percentage of uh, uh, the city population. So um, Alexandria's enrollment peaked in 1970 uh, at a little over about 17,000. Uh, and as a percentage of the total uh, city population, it was just below 20%. That falls in half within 20 years, right? Um, but it falls very steeply within four to five years. Um, it goes from nearly 20% to around 14% uh, within two or three year period. There's a significant exodus of, of, of white parents from, from, the school, uh, uh, from the school district. What's really remarkable also is that over this time period, the 70s and into the 1980s, Alexandria as a whole loses population at a time when Northern Virginia is growing quite dramatically. So all of the suburbs in Northern Virginia are gaining population and Alexandria is losing population, which is uh, kind of a remarkable feat. Um, in, the, in the midst of that exodus, uh, Alexandria School District did a survey of parents, okay? And they reported the survey in a way that's very misleading. Um, they asked parents, why are you leaving? Um, and then they gave them multiple options. And in their tally, 
they only included one of those uh, reasons and justifications. So um, I'm going to very quickly talk about, um, I want to talk about this column on the right in red. Um, these are parents who enrolled their children in private school uh, because we have most of those surveys. Um, and I was able to actually retabulate the surveys to more accurately capture what um, uh, parents were expressing. So 40% of those who left the school district um, were enrolled in private school uh, were upset with desegregation and busing uh, according to the school system, okay? Only 16% according to the school system uh, uh, were concerned about the quality of education and 18% gave other educational reasons or personal reasons. Now, because they only allowed one reason to be uh, included in this tally, that really distorted and misrepresented why parents uh, left for private schools. So if we go to the re recalculation of this, um, desegregation uh, and busing for private school parents is still around 45%, which is roughly comparable to the earlier tally. But what was really left out is quality of education in the Alexandria school system. So these private parents or these parents who are leaving to private schools saw integration as deeply tied to lowering of quality. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a very um, uh, common theme uh, in, 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 in white flight, that there's, an, that there's a linkage, an automatic linkage between the presence of black students and lower quality of education. Um, and so the, the school district actually tried to sort of suppress this information by not accurately tallying uh, uh, the, the preferences or, or opinions of, of parents. In response to this, in response to this white flight, the school system actually creates a tracking system in order to hold on to parents, okay? Through AP courses, through honors courses, and through the Talented and Gifted program, um, uh, there's an effort to preserve uh, uh, white uh, families within, within the school system. Um, it plays on this language that Booth talked about, that only individual students of outstanding merit who met the threshold would be allowed in. But what it doesn't do is really pay attention to the previous educational experiences of students prior to that evaluation, prior to that gatekeeping, right? So what winds up happening is continuing parallel tracks of students going in different directions, but maybe being in the same school. So I'm gonna end it there uh, and we're happy to take questions. Oh. Well, I have one other point about over-identification of students with disabilities uh, among students of color. So. And I'll pass it over to uh, Ms. Wood. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, and this quote is, is similar, the quote that Dr. Reed mentioned earlier um, when he was talking, and it's representative of the beliefs, the learned and taught um, ideology that brought about a double standard, especially during that time, and that we see infused in all aspects of our life today. Um, and I'm gonna read it because I, I just wanna be clear that these words are ingrained in every part of our society. And what he said was, while some remarkable individual African-Americans may have the character, intelligence, and other requisites entitling them to full first-class American citizenship, the Negro race as a race is very inferior to the white race. And this was said by State Senator Armistead Booth in a letter to a friend. And so when we think about this and we think about that double standard of what it meant for a black person during that time to even be considered equal, and we look at where we are today, we know that people of color who succeed or fit into the dominant culture are exceptions to the norm, an exception to their race and the perceptions around their race. It meant that you must be stellar to be included just to be equal. However, on the contrary, for our white brothers and sisters, success is the norm and is expected. And anything other than that is against the norm and an exception to that rule. So that perception and bias of the ability 
for a person of color to be equal, meaning that they have to be above and beyond and stellar, brings about that bias, explicit or implicit. And we still see that bias happening today. We still see it happening, whether it's overt or it's something that is unconscious, but it permeates through all of our systems, including our school system. Can you go to the next slide? As a contrast um, to what Booth stated in that last slide, this particular slide is the voice of our students. And this was written by one particular student um, and it captured the voice of a conversation, the voices of a conversation that we had with a student group about their experiences as students of color in Alexandria City Public Schools. And almost all of the students we met with um, were students who had, have gone through Alexandria City Public Schools from kindergarten to graduation. And one of the students was um, a current student in Alexandria. And so it reads, we demand change. Listen to black students, look into your classrooms and see the potential of all America, not just Caucasian students. Address how history is taught, encourage discussion around racial issues in classrooms, no matter how uncomfortable. Look into our, and look into other discipline methods, abolish biased zero tolerance policies, address intrinsic bias, address racist students. Never again allow a black or Latinx student to walk into your schools and feel unsafe because of the color of his, her, or their skin. Value our lives, Black Lives Matter. And this is a powerful summary that encapsulates that group's discussion and their responses to some of our questions around, you know, how they felt and some of the situations that they brought up in our discussion group about their experiences in Alexandria City Public Schools at different points within that period of their lives. Next slide, please. So when Alexandria City Public Schools looks at how we are moving beyond the resistance and indifference, we want to think about racial equality at the heart of everything we do. And you'll hear me say this over and over again until it sticks with everyone who's listening and anyone else that is out there. Um, we define racial equity when race does not determine quality of life, opportunities, and or outcomes for our students. Our goal is to collectively remove barriers that prevent someone from achieving their highest potential and that inhibit them from receiving the best educational experience possible. We work very hard to build relationships. We're working to encourage student voice and to embrace and value our students' identity to support all students to meet and exceed their own expectations and academic success. Next slide, please. Okay. And one thing that I was remiss in mentioning is I talked about the resistance, but I didn't really give any um, definition around the indifference and what that means when I say that. And indifference is that standing in the middle, being the bystander. Um, we are at a place in our journey where our Equity for All 2025 strategic plan is guiding our work. And at the heart of that guidance is racial equity. And we're teaching racial equity. And as a school system, we are on an anti-racist journey. And so that indifference is that middle of the road, that person who stands in the middle or who's a bystander, or the person who says the term, I'm not racist. And so what we are starting to talk about in our division and, and we're driving home is that that statement, I'm not racist or I'm indifferent or it's not me, means nothing to people who are experiencing inequities on a daily basis. There are people who are racist and there are people who are actively working to be anti-racist. And so when you stand in the middle and you are neutral to what is going on, then you are choosing to side with the oppressive system that we know 
is ingrained within our history and shows up within our present. So to close us out, our equity for all 2025 strategic plan goals with racial equity at the heart looks at five areas, systemic alignment, instructional excellence, student accessibility, family and community engagement, and strategic resource allocation. And through these five areas, we are tackling all of those things through a racial equity lens. So I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today. And I encourage you all to continue to learn, grow, and be the change that you wanna see moving forward. Join us on our equity and anti-racist journey in Alexandria City Public Schools. And at this time, I believe we are going to be open for questions. Thank you both for that incredibly informative and important presentation. We really appreciate it. We're so fortunate as a community to learn from the both of you. One question that's been submitted is, this has been a reminder that the inequities we see today are still evident within the hallways of our schools, despite everyone's best intentions. If you each had to make three recommendations of how to work to eradicate the current barriers that were so calculated in its design, what recommendations would you make to address these wrongs? So again, the question to sum up the question is, given that we do still see inequities in the hallways, what are three recommendations you can each make to address and remedy those inequities? Dr. Reed, would you like to start first, perhaps? Um, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think it's, it's great. Um, I would focus initially, um, and again, I also would defer to my professional colleagues who are in schools on a daily basis. I am a pointy headed academic. Um, and so, although I teach in colleges, um, there's a very different uh, enterprise to be running schools. And so I, uh, I respect greatly uh, their wisdom and expertise. Based on my sort of reading of, of all of this, um, I would focus on uh, developing teachers who are able to establish rapport across um, racial boundaries. Um, uh, the recruitment and development of, of, of teachers of color, um, especially uh, male teachers of color who could reach out and, and establish uh, a rapport and understand uh, the circumstances and contexts of learning that students are facing, I think is really powerful. And there's some evidence that that really leads to better outcomes for kids. Um, for a, a white teaching force, really understanding and under the, the, the racial dynamics and, and racial contexts of, of students' lives is, is really powerful and then helps them make those bridges. Um, I would also try to encourage other policies around housing. Um, Alexandria is fortunate that it has the uh, single high school that, in which to do that, but not all schools, school districts have that. Um, they have uh, divergent populations within their schools. And, and so housing segregation leads to uh, uh, disparities for outcomes. Um, the third one that I would probably focus on is, uh, is school level leadership. Um, of having having school level leaders that are committed um, to to closing closing exactly uh, uh, these gaps that that uh, Ms. Wood is, is is talking about in terms of of being committed to all students and and that leadership at the school level really matters and there's a set of skills that that principals have uh, that can be really powerful but I will pass it on to Ms. Wood for other things. Okay. So Dr. Reed, I, you know, you took a couple of mine, so I'm just going <laughs> to say that um, I agree with everything that you said, um, but also, we, also, you know, our, what are our, our training that we're doing to really have some conversations around racial equity and digging deep into, like we're doing now, our history, opening that dialogue and actively working against implicit and explicit biases that we see that are causing some of our students one, to not feel comfortable in certain spaces within our schools, um, and which in turn um, drives them to gravitate into like-minded and like areas um, to be around peers that think and feel the way that they do. So actively breaking that down, and that starts with building relationships and believing in all of our children as that student's um, beautiful words 
um, encapsulated the voice of all of our students. They need to feel valued, they need to feel like they're supported, and they need to feel like the teachers and the administration and the counselors and social workers all have their back through that um, and encourage them to reach their highest potential. Um, the third thing I would say is um, embrace and value all of our students' identities and all of what makes up who they are. Um, and by doing that, we continue, one, to build that relationship. We break down those walls and those barriers that are already put up and we allow students to flourish within their own skin. So respecting um, the identity and who they are and what they bring to the table. There's not one right way to do any of this. There's not one right way to learn. There's not one right way for students to receive information. And so listening to our students' voices, listening to what they need, respecting and valuing what they bring to the table, even though it may not look like what you think it should, or what any one person thinks it should, or any one group thinks it should, um, will help move us forward. Thank you, that was incredible, um, Ms. Wood. And also, it, it was such a powerful reminder of the student voice, which was actually one of our next questions. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for highlighting that, as it's incredibly mm -hmm. important. Um, we actually, unfortunately, only have time for one more question. This was such an informative panel and we have such phenomenal questions within the chat room, so I do apologize. We are asking the questions in the order they came in, but due to time constraints, we only unfortunately have time um, for one more. Um, if you might, I have this question for, it's slightly different for the both of you, but um, Dr. Reed, if you could start us off with, um, you know, as you know, a lot of what this identity project came about was the renaming of schools. And so uh, we are, as the school board, visiting the notion of renaming both T.C. Williams as well as there was a petition for Matthew Morey Elementary School. Dr. Reed, if we could start with you in terms of Matthew Morey, could you, is there any uh, research that you've had in terms of like what was the history behind na the naming of Matthew Morey Elementary School? And can you tell us about the Rosemont community and the segregation as well as the school board's position on race in the late 1920s? And then if you, if I may uh, end the conversation with you, Ms. Wood, the question for you will be, you know, speaking as a administrator and as an educator and as someone who's long devoted their career to ACPS, if you could perhaps share the lens of your thoughts as in terms of the naming process and what does this mean for our community um, as we move forward. But Dr. Reed, if we could um, and conclude the last question beginning with you in terms of the Matthew Morey. Um, my, my, my response will be um, brief because it's, it's mostly uninformed. Um, I, I, my research, I, had, I didn't go back to the, the, the 20s and, and 30s. I'm familiar with the, um, uh, the acquisition and uh, sort of the um, uh, incorporation of, of both the Rosemont and the Del Rey uh, neighborhoods. They previously were separate communities outside of the municipal boundaries, um, but I'm not familiar with the, uh, the, the racial um, implications of that or, or Matthew Morey and the naming process. So I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't, I can, I'll do a little digging um, and, and try to find some out, um, but I, in my book, I'm sorry, I, I didn't address those things. No, it's not a problem, but we thank so much. And we've learned so much from your book that it covered so much. So you, you can't cover everything, but um, we really appreciate it. Um, Ms. Wood, if you wouldn't mind just commenting, you know, this is a hot topic, as you know, within the community. Um, do you have any um, just thoughts you want to share, reflections, and, and, and you know, maybe some you know, thoughts of that you've heard throughout your experiences as an educator and administrator in ACPS? Yes. So um, I... First of all, it's, you know, for a lot of our students, from what I'm hearing, it, it's an acknowledgement of where we are. It's an acknowledgement of where we are in our country, where we are um, racially, and the conversations that are starting to, that have been going on for a very long time, but are starting to reach places that they have not reached before. And um, I do know that some of this renaming came up in previous years and didn't really go um, any further than the petitions. However, um, at this time, I think we're at a place as a nation, we're at a place as a school system where we're ready to tackle those things head on. We're ready to take a really deep look, and we are taking a really deep look at who we are as a school system, what we represent, um, 
who our students are and how we're representing for them and to them and how they represent us as a school system. And this is the opportunity for us to move this movement further um, and continue it. And there's a momentum right now that we definitely need to take hold of and, and ride as far as we possibly can, but don't let it stop there. Um, we can't let it stop at the name changing. We can't let it stop at those conversations. We have to move this into our school buildings. We need to move this into our classrooms. We need to move this into our staff and um, reach that place where we have true equity for all of our students across the division. And so the name changing to me is, is the tip of the iceberg of of the things that need to happen and the things that we're working to do in order to ensure that all of our students feel that they are safe, they feel that they are valued, um, and they feel that they're respected when they come in to our school buildings. I cannot think of a better way to capture this panel and thank you so much for so nicely summarizing um, the importance of what we're doing as we move forward. I just want to take a moment to just thank, sincerely thank our panelists for a very important conversation. Um, I think we can all believe and remember that we must educate ourselves of the sins of our past in, short, in order to ensure that we work hard to remedy them and to strive to be the community in Alexandria that we always want to be, which is one where we truly honor the strength um, and the diversity of our community as our ultimate strength. So thank you so much for highlighting and reminding us of um, where we've been and also Ms. Wood of so nicely putting where we want to go. So thank you both. We really sincerely appreciate it. Thank you, thank Vice you. Chair Nolan. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And thank, thank you for you tuning in. And if I may, I just want to remind the community that we have our third and final reading. It will be October 8th at 6 p.m. The topic, as Dr. Reed referred to earlier, is going to be the real story behind the Remember the Titans story. Um, please note there will also be feedback opportunities for the community after these read-in sessions, and you can note them on um, our website for more information. And if I may, I just want to sincerely thank Dr. Hutchings for allowing this conversation, and please um, turn the mic over to him so he can close this out. And again, it was a true honor to be a part of such an illustrious group, and thank you again, um, Ms. Wood and Dr. Reed, for um, sharing your words of wisdom with us. And thank you, Ms. Nolan, for facilitating this discussion tonight. Um, we really appreciate you and all the effort, efforts that you and the board um, do on a continuous basis. Um, I do want to thank our panelists as well. And, you know, I was sitting here actually taking, you know, notes on my phone um, because there's so much correlation between our history and what we are faced with today. And it's very important for us to understand that if we don't find a way to rewrite the future, we are going to continue to have the same disparities uh, and the same opportunity gaps that are currently existing um, within our school division. And even now, I still receive emails about families who are not for Black Lives Matter. They're saying, why are we using the term? All lives should matter. It's, it's what many emails are saying to me today. And this is a prime example as to why, unfortunately, we still have to say black lives actually do matter in 2020. It's sad that we have to say that. That should be the conversation we should have, not why we're saying it. It should be a sad that we're still having to say that and inform our community that black lives you know, matter in the city of Alexandria. Um, and it's black and brown lives you know, today, especially in Alexandria City Public Schools. So I just wanna conclude by thanking um, the panelists and saying we have so much more work to do um, and I truly believe the simple fact that we are saying racial equity is the heart of everything that we do within Alexandria City Public Schools. The board unanimously adopted our strategic plan just a couple of months ago to say that we stand here and we stand tall to make a difference for every single student, especially our black and brown students in Alexandria City Public Schools. It says a lot about the courage and the boldness that our school division has. And I'm just looking forward to coming back many years from now and sharing our story on how we did it, how we changed that narrative. So with that, I will say have a good evening and thank you. <laughs>